in just a second. So you should be able to see now the, the slides in full screen. Let me know if you do not see this. Yeah, I can, then, see, I can see it, yeah, throughout this place, yeah. I'm going to put that over here. All right, um, so welcome everyone. Thanks for uh, for attending this webinar or viewing this since this is being recorded, viewing it at a later time. Uh, my full name is Konstantinos, or Kostas for short, uh, Karaidis. I am an associate professor at uh, UC Riverside. And the work that we are doing in our group, the Autonomous Robots and Control Systems Lab, is uh, centering on general robotics, but more lately we have fo been focusing a lot on agricultural robotics. So in... Uh, in a nutshell, the, uh, the research program in our lab is seeking to enable efficient and resilient multi-robot operation in real-world cases. And we want to do this either autonomously or in some cases in cooperation with humans. And the main idea here is that whenever you deploy robots out in the world, in the real world, there is uncertainty. And we're trying to understand how we can actually use this uncertainty when it makes sense. And the approach we're taking is essentially a holistic approach that it is integrating different directions, foundation robotics directions, starting from robot design and fabrication, all the way to embodied uh, AI. This is the autonomous decision making I have in here. So the reason that we need to integrate all of these directions is that the uncertainty we can find in the task, we can find in the environment, and we can find within the system itself, both in its actuation and its perception. So the main idea is that we can bring in the different tools here, that we can integrate them and we can deal with different things, with different directions or different areas of uncertainty. So exactly because we integrate these different tools, right now the applications that are that our group six uh, that is focusing are on precision agriculture, which is what I'm going to discuss today, environmental sensing and human robot collaboration. The images you see here are some of the examples of robots that are most of them we have built in, in the lab. Some are uh, both of the server that we have integrated other sensors and actuators on top of them or custom end effectors. Uh, I'm not going to talk about all of this today. If you are interested in learning more about research, I'll be more than happy to, to discuss. So please feel free to reach out. But the main idea I want to highlight, hence I'm showing this slide, is that by taking all of these different foundation robotics uh, directions and merging them, we, we can then start creating tools that may carry over, at least may help test some initial hypothesis across different application domains, which might not seem related at first, but there are actually re relevances between this. Um, so I'll leave it here. If you would like to learn more, I would be more than happy to discuss it offline. And I'll focus on today's um, presentation, which is on our agricultural robotics research. We have been focusing on two families of problems, let's say. So one is uh, centered on autonomous mobility, which we can think about answering the question of where to sample. And within that family or within this category, we're addressing joint task and motion planning for optimal, or in some cases on the go sampling. Essentially, you have the robot moving in the field and making decisions based on real-time data it's collecting on the spot. So for instance, you can think of instead of getting all of the data and going to the lab and creating an agronomic map, we can start creating this agronomic map on the go. So I'll show some results that are related to optimal uh, sampling. Um, we have also been focusing on exploration that we can tune for efficiency versus speed of unknown environments. The, the, um, the image you see at the right hand side is an example of this. And the broader umbrella term, let's say navigation, using multimodal sensory data. Today, I'll focus on only one very specific aspect, which uh, I'll leave it for the end. So the second um, umbrella of projects under these two families that I mentioned earlier has to do with how to integrate acquisition perception for proximal and physical sampling. And that you can think of answering the question of how to sample. On this direction, we've been focusing on different, on different, different problems. Uh, one of these, which is more well developed so far, has to do with root zone soil electrical conductivity, which is a very, very important metric. Leaf retrieval and phenotyping, and then switching a little bit gears, um, focusing with insects, both in terms of how we can capture them and transfer them, and then also doing insect uh, automated insect pairing, which is more on the devices aspect 
using some robotics, but it's not mobile robotics per se. Everything as you see here is actually mobile robotics. So I'm not going to talk about all of this. I'm going to talk about a few stuff, but not about all of this. And the, the focus today is on four aspects. One is optimal sampling, so I don't know, motion planning for optimal sampling. Second is the root zone soil, soil electrical conductivity as an example of a proximal sampling, um, proximal sensing task that we can address with a robotic technology. Leaf retrieval, which is an example of a physical sampling task. And then within the umbrella term of navigation, I would like to highlight something that I think might be more uh, like more of interest to a greater audience, which is a new data set that we have just published, which is about um, helping robot localization, mapping, and scene understanding. So I'll leave this for the end. For, uh, for sampling, the way that we have set up the problem is the following. And we assume that there is, that we have specific tasks and there's a specific urgency to these tasks. So for instance, if there is a, uh, a known patch in the field where water might not um, uh, might, might stay there or it may, it may not drain very well, then this may be an area that if I have a robot that's looking for, uh, for soil moisture, that may be given, like go to that area may be a task of higher urgency. At the same time, we assume we have sample information. Again, the fields do not change overnight, but Changes may happen in the sense that um, the drip irrigation system might block. So although I think I'm watering, I am not. So this is the untrustworthiness in terms of prior information. And in practice, there are always specific budgets on what a robot can do. You can think about if you have a robot that it is carrying, um, it's carrying let's say, fertilizer, there is a specific payload of how much it can carry. If it is taking samples again, same payload. If it is a robot that it is only, even, only in quotes, even sensing, you can think that if, if you let it run for a long time on um, in, in midday, the sensors will start overheating and then sometimes they may actually switch off. This is true story. So these are specific, we can cast them as within the context of employment or planning problem as budgets on those actions. And then we also, assume that we have an, an initial idea of how much it's going to cost to perform a specific action. So for instance, if I want to take a specific soil, uh, soil sample, it might uh, account for two minutes and uh, require five, uh, five watts. Um, but this may actually change. It's just an expectation. As you um, do it in practice, this might change. So this is a fairly general problem and um, problem set up. And what we try to do is to perform optimal sampling. So we're going to select and schedule the tasks in the field, given some approximate information about the prior map. And in addition, decide when to stop. So when the robot should actually go into a base station if one is available, in order to avoid exceeding a given task, task capacity. And the penalty we give if this happens is that the whole task has been, or that whole sequence of tasks that may have to happen are getting invalidated, which is pretty bad. So we really don't want to exceed a given task capacity. For instance, if you are carrying a payload and you over overdo it and then everything falls down, that's pretty bad. So we try to, roughly speaking, or colloquially speaking, avoid this type of situations. The underlying mathematical tool we use for planning in this line of work is called the stochastic L graph. So one consideration or one selection we're making here is that we move in rows, and that's why we can actually cast this as this so-called L graph. The stochastic comes from the point of view that going from one node to another, from one vertex to another, there is some uncertain terms of there may be a branch that was not up there, so the robot might need more time to overtake it. Uh, so there's this stochasticity there. So the example you see here, and let me get into my laser pointer. So this example you see here is that if I, let's say, focus only on this four by two component, the stochastic L graph construction is taking this four by two, which are the eight nodes that you see in the middle, and it is adding two virtual uh, columns at the end, which is where Essentially, we do this assuming that this is where our base and station are. 
we can assume we have both in both ends, and then there is zero cost or there is a cost actually to go from one row to another. I mean, this is mostly for being able to make the problem mathematically uh, well defined. There are two independent budgets, as I talked before. One is the energy budget for moving from one node to another, and the second is a resource budget that's linked to task execution. And when the robot is going to the base station, we assume that both of these budgets return to their initial values. Now, this is on the planning aspect. To practically do this, there might be some wait time at the robot. Let's say if it overheats, it might need to pause and wait a little bit and then move on. Or if you are thinking of a problem where there might be humans and robots collaborating, so the robot, for example, is, is carrying fruits from one place to another, there is some time, some wait time that the human would take the fruit out of, of the basket. Let's say if the robot is carrying a basket, we don't consider it here. But in practice, this is something that would need to be integrated in this work moving forward for testing it fully into the field. Uh, so we have developed this NBAP, NBAP algorithm, and it balances sampling those feasible edges on the stochastic L graph and determining when the robot should exit and go back to the base station using an approach that has three specific phases. In the first phase, we're essentially looking into which tasks or in the stochastic L graph, which vertices are feasible to achieve given that I have sufficient resources on the robot. For instance, if I'm doing a watering task, I have sufficient water in order to be able to water the plants. Um, and I link those or um, the hierarchy in those, um, in those vertices is based on the priority level that we have assumed we have already, which is based on prior information or some user-defined um, um, guidelines. In the second phase, we sample feasible vertices from this phase one, given now bringing into consideration the energy budget. So yes, there I have enough, uh, let's say water in the robot to be able to water that specific plant. And then I'm asking, do I have enough power to go to that area and then come back? So we always count both. I go to some specific edge, some specific node in my graph, and then I have enough power to get back. And in the, in the third phase, we are selecting which row is actually maximizing the, the, the gain, and the robot would go to that row first. So this is, in, um, in, in short, how this algorithm works. The short kind, short kind of um, visual representation is that we start with a priority, with the highest priority tasks. In the first case, we are looking, there are physical vertices, um, of that highest level priority that meet our research budget? If yes, then we put them into a list. Then from that list, we, we query which of these are uh, sufficient energy to get to that. And then, or as long as I have sufficient energy and highest priority vertices, I keep visiting those until at some point I'm running out of either in which case the robot will return to the base station and the process repeats until I have covered pretty much all of uh, all of the tasks. And in that case, the algorithm will end. So we have tested this algorithm in uh, using data, real world data from this are from soil moisture. This is uh, from, 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 uh, from our collaborator, Stefano Carpina at UC Merced. So they had collected the data set that contained uh, soil moisture values and um, these were taken in specific areas in, in a vineyard, so we can actually cast this data into a stochastic L graph. The ground truth in these cases was the difference between what was the desired moisture level and what was the actual collected uh, soil moisture level. And uh, we tested our approach using both single robot and multi-robot cases. We had one and five, we also test 10 robots, but it did not make any, any huge difference. Here I'm showing one and five robot cases. Um, and uh, the comparisons we made were against the typical naive, let's say, loan more. So the robot would just go into this typical loan more pattern, an informed loan loan more mower version, in which we were giving the tasks that had highest priority. So we would kind of steer where the lo how the loan more would actually initiate, and then with the series greedy partial uh, row planner, which is part of. Um, of Stefan Carpin and, uh, and other colleagues. 
and we we uh, we test against these algos. In terms of what is the gain per visited vertex, what are wasted resources? Again, remember that if a robot is greedily going to pick a task and exceeds the the budget it has, then it loses all of the the benefits it had for and since the prior reload that was in um, essentially visiting a base station. So we want to essentially increase the percent of gain per visited vertex, decrease the wasted resources, and the total visited vertex is, is another metric in terms of how well we explore the area. So in all of these cases, our algorithm was able to outperform all other algorithms. And in uh, 13 of those 20 cases, we had no wasted resources. Uh, I have highlighted here the performance of, of an algorithm, and it is in, in all cases, it's uh, it's out, outperforming the rest of the algorithms, which is a good thing because it say it shows essentially that by bringing so something I did not talk, but essentially we are using optimal stopping theory to determine when to exit. So by bringing this uh, this tool in here, that essentially makes the algorithm decide optimally when it should just try to to achieve one more task or fulfill one more task or perhaps leave a task that has the highest priority so a greedy planner would actually pick in order to do more tasks with smaller priority, but then in that case, not risk of uh, exceeding, exceeding any budget. And um, this helps actually get into the results that I'm showing here. So that was the first part. Now, I will switch gears into parts two and three. Let me see how I'm doing in terms of time. Okay, I'm good. So I'll switch gears and um, I'll go into ans trying to answer some questions that relate to how to sample, proximal sensing and physical sampling. I'll start with proximal sensing and then I'll move on with physical sampling. So the proximal sensing example I have here, uh, give me a second. So the proximal sensing example I have here is on measuring soil apparent electrical conductivity, the ECA. This is a very important metric because it's being used in optimal water content management, geological, geological mapping, yield prediction. Um, so it is a metric that it is important. Agronomists do want to, to quantify this. However, the problem is that it is typically quite laborious. So in the image that you see here, this is one of the graduate students in our group who is manually essentially carrying a sensor um, we need to get as close to the root zone as possible. So you see that uh, he's carrying the sensor, the, the yellow, the, the orange cylinder that you see down here, uh, as close to the root zone as possible. He's looking into the data logger and he's essentially walking through the field. Again, you can do it for a little bit, but if you want to do it for a very large field or if you want to do it... Uh, multiple times so that you have dense sampling. This is, of course, not scalable. The other approach is to use tractors. Uh, the problem with the tractors is that you cannot really go very close to the root zone. So here in that middle in that middle figure here, I'm showing the, the relation of our current robot, earlier work, which is in, in case 2021 was an even smaller robot. But now in this work, we want to be able to integrate full autonomous operation. So for that, we need to put more sensors and for that, we need to have more payload. I'll talk about sensors in a little bit later, but you can see essentially the difference in size. So this robot can go very close to the root zone and it can do everything autonomously. So our design, our goal in this line of research is to be able to design, test and evaluate uh, wheeled robots and manned ground vehicles to provide accurate uh, ECA maps at a field scale on demand. So I have the robot ready to go. I need a measurement today. I'm hitting go and I have the robot do it. Everything for me coming back into that base station that we discussed before, um, dropping the data, and then we can make the, the, the agronomic maps, the CA maps. So this is what we have done currently. This is what I'm going to show you today. But part of ongoing work actually tries to do this completely on the go and we construct those CA maps as the robot is navigating into the field. So in this work compared to our, to our older work uh, is that we tried to do things in a manner which is scalable. So it's not that this is a robot we have in the lab and then if anyone else here wants 
to replicate the results, they have to redo the whole thing. So we try to make some of these things a little bit scalable. Now, something which is not scalable is the actual identification of the electromagnetic interference. So the, um, the sensor, this uh, run sensor, you see this is an electromagnetic induction sensor. It creates a current on one end. It goes through the soil. And because of the soil salinity and all of the other stuff that's going on in there, the magnetic field is changing. And then the other end of the sensor is picking this up. It's measuring the distance. And through calibration, you can essentially estimate the, the soil salinity, the, the apparent electrical connectivity. And from, from that, you can link this to, to soil salinity. So by the virtue of the principle of operation of this, uh, of this sensor, anything metallic, any type of sensor, for instance, GPS, is creating electromagnetic interference. So when we put on the robot, we essentially want to put that sensor, the MI sensor, the orange cylinder, as far from um, the body of the robot as possible. That's one condition. The other condition is that you know to be able to carry the, the sensor and not be not hit on, on obstacles when even I have the tiniest bump. I need to bring the sensor as close to the body. So essentially minimize this level arm here, which is completely contradicting my other um, my other um, determinant of behavior, which is minimizing electromagnetic interference. So there are two things that we have to do here. One is understand what is the effect of electromagnetic interference as I go in different distances from the robot. Unfortunately, this is something that has to do every time. So let's say any of you take the same robot, take, take the same sensor. So this is the the, the CMD tiny. Um, here it is. So you will need, because you may have different types of sensors in the robot, you will need to do what I'm going to tell you now. But at least what we have done is systematic, so you will be able to repeat those steps. So here, what we have done is that we test we tested the robot in three different field experiments, and we tested at different distances from the frontal planes or from the front face of the robot or the back. I mean, this is carrying; it doesn't really matter. But so here it's trailing shot at the backside um, from ten to hundred centimeters. We had a step of ten centimeters, and in the graph that you see on the right hand side, you can see that yes, as expected, the closer you are to the robot, the highest the interference. So this is the measurement of the robot when you are in a bare field, essentially. So this would be as low as possible. But when you bring close to the robot, you get essentially erroneous measurements. And what is worse is not the amplitude of the difference, but it's actually the variability you get as you do different measurements. And I'll show you in a, uh, very shortly what it means if you do not have this variability. And then we see that as we start getting further and further away from the robot, starting at 40 centimeters all the way to 100 centimeters, then this interference becomes smaller. And we picked these 40, 50, 60, and 70 centimeters as viable configurations so that it is not sticking too out too long. Um, 70 centimeters is already too, too long. So that's why we, we just left the 80, 1900, which is these very low ones here um, out of the picture. But again, essentially, between 50 and 100 centimeters, there is not really any significant difference. So this post, unfortunately, has to happen every time from scratch. Hopefully, these steps uh, will help other users to, to be able to do this process. But what we have also developed, which is something that can scale, is a digital twin method. So here, essentially, let me put everything out. So essentially, here we are mapping the environment that we want to be able to, to, to like the field that we want we want to able to we want to map uh, this is essentially just flying uav for for a, for a few minutes and then getting the the data stitching the images and then creating a 3d world mess so in uh, in our in our publication um all of the steps are actually outlined in detail then you can spawn your own robot here we have a clear path jackal robot you spawn it in Gazebo, which is a simulator, and then we have developed um, a file that integrates the MI sensor, and then a plugin that pulls everything together. And then essentially, you have the robot following different desired trajectories. These are just three samples, and we are measuring the oscillations of um, of um, the 
the, the sensor when we put at different distances from the body and at different distances of the gun. Because the short, the smaller this distance is, this I'm going to go back one slide. This dh is the distance of, of the height of the ground. So the shorter it is, the more probable is that this sensor is going to hit on, on, on something and we try to avoid it. But if you make it over 10 centimeters, then you may not necessarily get good measurements. So between five and 10 is, is the optimal range. Through the digital twin, we identified that from a mechanics or from a design point of view, six centimeters is good enough to be able to navigate or traverse that specific terrain that we wanted to actually map. This whole process, we have outlined all of the steps. This is something that hopefully can help make um, these processes faster, more scalable, and all of these are available. So we tested our, our work into two types of field experiments. One was in an arid olive grove. So we had first the, the poor grad student wo walking through the field. This is this U-turn type of object that he followed. And we have gotten all of the data from the sensor, georeferenced them, and then map and then plug them in our ArcGIS, if I remember correctly. And just here from the color code, you can see the different values, minimum to maximum, individual measurement as these black dots. Same thing, same trajectory with the robot. Color code wise, you can see that these are actually matching quite well. What I want to bring your attention, however, to is those actual numbers, the mean and the, the standard deviation. So two observations, the means do vary. So when we do manual data collection, we have a smaller mean than when we put the robot. And the reason we have this is because of the interference that the robot is causing to the sensor. The good news, however, is that if you look into the standard deviation, the variability in the measurements is essentially the same or very, very, very similar, which means that the only difference we have is a constant DC gain offset, which you see actually in the graph here, uh, that we could either, if we know it, we can filter it out or we can subtract it or we can keep it as is and just know that my measurements are plus some offset. So this is what we did in this arid olive grove. Um, we also did it in, in a recently irrigated, irrigated orange grove. So the data here are a little bit more variable because of, uh, of the, the, recent, the recent watering, but are consistent with the previous case. Again, handheld case, robot case, means vary by about the same amount. It's about four. And the standard deviation is actually pretty close in one, one case is 226 and the other is 202. So pretty consistent results. And you can see the same type of analogies in the graph before. So these are good results that are indicating that we can actually create ECA maps using these, uh, these mobile robots. There is a, a calibration kind of phase beforehand to understand what would be an optimal placement of the sensor with respect to the robot, which depends on what the robot is and what sensors it carries. For example, the GPS or a LiDAR, cameras, all of these are playing playing role. But once you do this, then the rest essentially tells us that the robot should be ready to go. The results tell us that. And, and we have done this offline. So we had the robot, it drove into the field, we got the data, and then we did the, the just special mapping. Part of ongoing work is doing this on the go. So the second um, or the third topic is on physical sampling. And the specific example we have here is about reef retrieval. The bigger umbrella of this specific project is about um, automating some of the processes that underlying stem water potential analysis using the pressure chamber. So we have current work, which is under review that essentially focuses on how to automate the pressure chamber itself. What I want to talk today here is about how do we actually get a leaf from a tree. We need to cut it cleanly at its stem. So then we can take this and put it into the pressure chamber. We have focused, focused on, on integrating actuation perception. The overall system overview is shown on the slide. So for the perception, as essentially, we have a stereo camera, or an RGBD camera. We get a point cloud. And then we're using um, classical computer vision tools to being able to get uh, the foreground down sampling because we have too many uh, points. Then do a clustering, 
create six debounding boxes, meaning that we need to be able to get both position and orientation in 3D space. And then that is giving us a potential leaf Q. Once we have this Q, then we go into the actuation module, which essentially tells us out of all of these leaves, which are within the current work, workspace of the robot. We have focused so far on, on, the, on static manipulation, like the robot goes close to the, to the tree and then we only switch on the robot arm motion. Part of ongoing work is doing this into a mobile manipulation, par mobile manipulation paradigm. So once we have all of this, then we can go to an offset um, pose, which is essentially some offset distance from a leaf, which is identified. Go close and well, go closer to the leaf, enclose it, cut it, and then return home if we will have success. If failure, then keep doing this, or even if we do have success, we can keep doing this repeatedly. And I'm going to show you some, some examples of this. This is on the perception aspect and uh, instance of how it works. We have tested things, uh, all of these actually that you see here, both indoors and outdoors with different lighting variations. Uh, the first version, the first working version of our custom end effect of this is all designed in the lab. So it, it is on here. We have also a newer version right now, um, but you can see it cleanly here. The main idea is that you have a point which is doing the excision of the leaf here. So there is uh, a guillotine kind of um, um, four bar mechanism with uh, with an exacto blade here, and then a stereo camera, the stereo camera looking into the leaf. This here in figure A is a snapshot when you are far away, so you can see different leaves. We are finding we're extracting the background, keeping the foreground, down sampling because again we have too many spaces to too many points to process, doing the clustering, and then finding the bounding boxes. Once we have the found the, the bounding boxes. And it is important that we focus on six depots because how we align the robot arm essentially is determined or how we assign priority to leaf candidates in the sense that one may be better than another is also taking into consideration what is the, the orientation of the leaf. Because if there is a leaf which has very awkward orientation or if there is a leaf that is completely um, outside of, uh, of the reachable workspace of the, of the end effector, of the manipulator, or even if it is within the reachable workspace, but it might risk having the manipulator get close to a singularity point, then all of these are being filtered out. So we do need the, the we do need orientation as well as positions, hence the six depots. And our more recent version, which is uh, work which is currently under review, has a newer cutter, uh, fully integrated with a pneumatic system. There are two components here. One is pneumatic actuation. So this is a pulley uh, system. And essentially, the, the pump down here, it's creating uh, all of the actuation we need to in order to be able to quickly operate this. The camera is uh, shown as well. And then there is also an air suction component, which is this hose that you see here, which actually kind of helps aligning, helps aligning the leaf uh, with the end effect. And this can actually help resolve some of some, some perception issues that we may actually encounter. Um, so we have designed these uh, these um, end effectors, these two variant variants. We have tested them both in the field. In study cases, we have also integrated into a full-blown system. This is the clear path husky robot. And we have this tested both indoors and outdoors. In uh, our more recent results, we actually have pretty good um, pretty good uh, findings. So here, for example, in indoors, out of possible leaves, these are actually with a potted avocado tree. Uh, so out of the candidate leaves, there are 46 leaves, 46%, which are viable. We can capture successfully 75 of them, and then out of this, we can cut 92% successfully. Um, these are pretty good numbers compared to earlier work where we did not have all of these improvements as in this work. We have gotten, um, I want to say an order of magnitude, but it's actually the, the increase is, is substantial and it works both indoors and outdoors. And let me show you how all of these now are completely integrated into one uh, singular system. So here we have the, the Husky, uh, the Clearpath Husky robot. We have the Kinova Gen 2 or the Yako. 
the robot arm. We have designed the end effector and then all of the pneumatics and everything else here. The um, sensors are being provided by the robot. So we have odometry, we have IMU, we have uh, GNSS. All of these are being fueled by algorithms that we have developed in the lab. We are using the LiDAR up here, not for navigation, but essentially to construct a local map to be able to understand um, the scene. And then the camera on the end effector is used for this localized perception to identify those leaves, find appropriate uh, candidates, and then go for this. And we have done field experiments when there is ambient light, uh, varying ambient light and different wind conditions. Let me show you this place. Um, so I'm going to play this for a while. So pause this for a second. Uh, so what you see here is essentially a third person view of the robot. On this panel, you are seeing the, the, the visualization in RVs. The different points here is, are the point clouds. And then here, where is my mouse cursor, you are going to see the first person view, which is what you can actually see from the camera. I'm not going to play this whole video. It's, it's five minutes and after a while it becomes a little bit repetitive, but it is in our YouTube channel. So if you want to view this, um, you can you can find it easily. So I just want to highlight a couple of things and then I, I will move on also in the interest of time. So let me get uh, this. So this is uh, the first person view as well. So you can see that right now, the leaves are actually moving quite a lot. Um, we make a scan, we get some initial positions and then essentially we are assigning target frames. Once we have those target frames, the robot will the, the end effector will be tasked to go to an offset position close to the leaf. It's going to come and capture this leaf that you see here where it's my mouse. Um, so you can see it in a second. And once there is this uh, determination of uh, of um, of the of the target frame, then the robot will try and will approach the leaf and will enclose it again. So this is the leaf we don't see it here, but it's the leaf that has been already enclosed. So once you do this, then the, the blades will actuate, the cut, the leaf will be cut and it will be collected into the chamber, this inside chamber. Now, for, we have implemented different safety routines. That's why it is this slow. So part of future work is making this faster. The perception works pretty fast. The planning aspect can be improved, uh, but it is one of, 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 it's one direction of ongoing work. And um, again, mobile manipulation, this is static manipulation. So I go close to the tree and then I'm only moving the robot arm, moving both the robot arm and the, mo the mobile base is part of, of ongoing work as well. So in this example, we have the robot now. It has collected the, the, the leaf. It is going back to home and then it's going to navigate into a different set, into a different tree, um, make a different attempt. So in the second tree that goes now, it actually fails to pick the tree. But we also then have a fail safe procedure in the sense that if it fails, it can go to the next tree. Or if I have already a predetermined set of trees, it can just query and sequentially go from one to another. And we have selected to pick only one leaf per tree, but we could also do multiple leaves. These are different parameters that we can use to tune this algorithm. Important thing is that everything here works fully on board. And um, it's it's uh, integrating multiple uh, pieces of software together with all of these different components from the robot arm to the mobile manipulation to the sensors to the end effector itself. So with that, hold this and then move out. So with that, I will come to the final part of uh, of the talk. And again. Overall, the umbrella here, the umbrella term is navigation. I want to specifically focus on only one thing, which is one of our most recent works. And then this, this is actually a new data set we have made available for the community. This is called the Citrus Farm data set. And um, I do have a link. I mean, this is, if you look, if you Google it, you can find it. This is the link and also have a QR code somewhere in the slides. We have a, um, a the clear path jackal robot, which is interface with multiple sensors. I'll go over the sensors in a second. We have, and then we have used this, this robot to essentially create full field reconstructions using multimodal data, uh, sensory data 
of um, orange, uh, orange groves, three different orange groves, and then the robot is actually moving into different paths. So let me let me show you what I mean. You, you can use this data set for localization mapping if you're coming from a completely robotics point of view. Uh, also for crop monitoring, there are, as I saw in a second, images where, videos actually, and images where there are fruits. So if you're going to do fruit identification, partial fruit counting, these are all um, directions of research can be afforded by this data set. It is for citrus tree farms specifically though. And uh, we have integrated nine different modalities, nine different sensing modal modalities. There are two, two categories. One is uh, domain specific, let's say. So I'm using stereo RGB, depth camera, a monochrome camera, a near infrared camera, and a thermal camera. So in the figure here, you can see the thermal camera, monochrome, and then the red, green, near infrared. The stereo camera up front. And then... Um, for, um, for localization, navigation, odometry, we're using the wheel odometry that's being provided by the robot itself. LiDAR, which is up here. IMU, there is an IMU in, inside the robot, but we picked a different IMU that we put here as an external, which is where my cursor is. And then an RTK GPS. We tested with uh, with not RTK or with, more, or with regular GPS, and we could not get good, good ground truth with RTK we have managed to get actually pretty good counters. Uh, all of this is actually available. Tested in three different fields uh, this past summer, and the total operation time is 1.7 hours. The robot traveled save 7.5 kilometers, and the total data set size is 1.3 terabytes. These are some examples of different fields and different trajectories that are being um, uh, done or being conducted in those fields. The main field, the main difference in these fields is the planting pattern. Also in the mo into the motion, but really into the planting, pa planting pattern. So in field one, which is this one here, there is sparse and uniform planting. In field two, it's kind of dense, and the robot really has to move in an in-row kind of manner, which going back to the first part of the talk, this is where a stochastic L graph or just an L graph would actually apply to. And in the third case, is a very dense environment, so there's absolutely no way that you can cut through a row, and it's definitely in row, and this is where a nail graph or a stochastic nail graph directly applies. Different motion patterns, all of them looking more of like lawn mower, but we have different uh, different motions as well. Again, all of these are are pretty detailed into the data set. Um, some images, again, these are the QR codes that you can get, but if you Google it, you can, you can find it as well. So aerial imagery from the different fields, specific snapshots, this is from some trees, and this is, um, I think, actually essentially green oranges. Um, and then, well, maturing. And then uh, in those other cases, from different viewpoints, have very clear now distinctions of, uh, of color coded. So again, if uh, there is an area of research that you may be interested in terms of doing fruit counting, color fiducials, shape fiducials, this data set actually can be used. Um, it's completely open source. We are maintaining it. So if, um, uh, you know, I would welcome you to, to download it and try it out. And if there are, is anything that you see that may be broken or any suggestions you may have for improvements, anything, please feel free to reach out. Uh, these are examples here from different fields of the same exact snapshot and uh, the different uh, sensing modalities, monochrome, thermal, RGB depth, RGN, and then computing and DVI from this. All of these are available into the data set. So with that, I think I'm, about this is about time for me so um we've been focusing on agricultural robotics into different areas which we can uh, broadly categorizing them into categorize them into two families of works one is where to sample and the second is how to sample today i gave a summary of uh, works in both i know i talked about a lot of stuff into a not that le great level of detail so if you have any questions whatsoever about any of what I talked today or I didn't talk, 
please, uh, you can ask me now or you can always reach out to me. Um, so this is not the work of one person. Again, I started by saying that we do all of these uh, different pieces of work into the lab. This has taken, you know, th this did not happen overnight. It has taken years. It has taken good, solid collaborations with lots of folks, even outside of, actually, mostly outside of engineering. Um, they would not fill all of them into one slide. Here in this slide, I'm highlighting those who have contributed to the project that I specifically discussed today, uh, but there are many more uh, collaborators, current group members, alumni yes. that have been contributing to, to the lab. So I do want to give um, a big thank you to, to all of the folks, not only those that are listed in this slide. And finally, I would like to, to thank all of you for attending this, uh, this webinar. And any questions you may have, I'll be more than happy to take them. Thank you. Thank you.